From Samueli Institute headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, this is On Human Flourishing. I'm Dr. Wayne Jones. My guest today is Dr. Robert Benaktar, the Director of Pain Management at the Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine in La Jolla, California. At the time we did this interview, Dr. Benaktar was the President of the American Academy of Pain Management, one of the largest pain management organizations in the country. Dr. Benaktar has an extensive background in mind-body medicine, acupuncture, and herbs. His current clinical and research interests involve new approaches to pain management, including dietary supplements, and biostimulation, and micro-laser and auricular acupuncture therapies. The American Academy of Pain Management is one of the largest professional pain organizations and pain management organizations in the country. Scripps obviously is well known to many people. It's one of the premier healthcare uh, centers in the country. And yet you're doing something that's sort of out of the box here, that, uh, you know, integrative practices, non-pharmacological approaches to pain. This is not the typical type of thing that people think when they think of pain and pain treatment. Right. So tell me a little bit about how you got into this. You're a conventionally sure. trained doc. How did you get involved in this? What what sort of motivated you to look into these areas? Absolutely. Thanks for question. Uh, thanks for the question, and, and real pleasure to be here today. For me, integrative medicine, having grown up outside the United States, um, was not really seen as an alternative. So, uh, growing up, you know, uh, natural products, uh, dietary approaches for chronic disease. Uh, you know, traditional healers, that was something I was used to. Um, Where did you grow up? Uh, so I was born in uh, Iran. Oh, I see. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, seeing um, uh, traditional healers, having house calls um, was was very conventional to me. Um, and mm -hmm. then in the, um, having uh, moved to the United States, preparing for medical school, I was fortunate enough to do a Richter Fellowship in Southeast Asia. And again, one of the uh, most uh, amazing things about that is uh, how the conventional and what we call complementary here got along. So if someone's going into surgery, they're, they might be having uh, Qigong healing or guided imagery, post-op, you know, there's a heavy emphasis on nutrition and uh, mindful movement like Tai Chi. And there was no turf battles because it was all about the outcome. And it was about, you know, not saying this is Western or Eastern, but it's good for the patient. So having gone through medical school uh, and residency, for me, it seemed natural that and when someone's in pain, you're going to use the best medications, you're going to use the best exercises, diet, supplements, uh, mind-body therapies. And um, the American Academy of Pain Management similarly has a, a similar, has a similar view. I mean, the majority of uh, members are uh, prescribing clinicians. But we also understand that working with our colleagues, who are massage therapists, chiropractors, et cetera, is the best way to approach pain. What's nice at this juncture in pain management in America is we, we've recognized that we do typically not the best job, uh, and that's putting it nicely. Um, you know, recent surveys have said that, you know, recent one in neuropathic pain said that only about a quarter of patients, if you follow guidelines, evidence-based guidelines, get measurable benefit after one year and opioids may not have significant long-term benefit so if we are doing the best evidence-based job and it's still not doing what we want we really have to expand the toolbox and also help navigate the toolbox with our patients yeah so a bigger toolbox is essential if only one in four of your patients are actually getting better with the best that you can provide exactly in conventional exactly. medicine in those areas um, the, uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, to hear that uh, some of the practices that are outside the U.S. then are found to be beneficial uh, and, and not taken up in these areas. Uh, in the pain area, it's sort of been an invisible area in medicine, hasn't it? I mean, there's not a, there's not, uh, it, for many, many years, it wasn't, nobody owned it. There wasn't right. necessarily a pain specialist, and uh, there weren't pain centers, and uh, and yet it was huge. A hundred million people uh, have chronic pain in the United States. Right. Billions of dollars is, is spent on that. And yet it was sort of this invisible thing. Um, right, right. Uh, 
Only now are we really recognizing that, but you were a pioneer in these areas for many, many years. So in many ways, it seems like, uh, you know, the time has come. <laughs> the, the time has <laughs> After come. After all the years that you've worked Absolutely. in these areas, the time uh, has come when finally uh, it's being recognized as an issue. Absolutely. Uh, and I think a big part of that was the Institute of Medicine report in 2010, right. Transforming Pain, which, b you know, basically summarized the situation by saying, you know, we need a huge transformation. We need more individualized pain care, not just specific what the guidelines say, and a lot more self-care. So reading between the lines, it really said, uh, you know, the door needs to be much wider open and ready to incorporate some of these options because self-care uh, at its core involves, you know, talking about sleep, talking about diet, talking about spirituality which in many, uh, in most cases, I would say a pain patient going to a typical pain clinic was not having any of that discussion. So I think the timing was right. American Academy of Pain Management has been doing integrative multidisciplinary work for decades. I think now, um, you know, the, the white papers and the guidelines are saying that we need to move in that direction for many reasons. One, we need to have more effective treatments. We need to have more patient-centered, friendly treatments. We need to have more cost-effective treatments. Um, so it, it's good to be at this time in, in pain management. It's unfortunate, uh, which you started with, that it's still patients, a uh, Kaiser study just came out uh, last month or so that said over half of pain patients are getting integrative therapies, acupuncture, massage, manipulation, less than half are talking to their patients. So you, you have the scenario of integrative care being done in a fragmented, non-integrative manner. Hmm. So these silos are not really integrated and that's the next challenge. So it's integrative, but it's not integrated. Yes, exactly. <laughs> An important <Not> distinction <laughs> and only a couple letters difference between exactly. those two words, which kind of confused folks. Yes. I'd like to step back and ask you to give us some sort of a concrete example of how you approach pain mm -hmm. patients, because a lot of our listeners, both uh, perhaps patients themselves, or they have uh, family members that are patients, or even professionals, uh, do you have an approach that you take to provide an integrated, integrative approach right. for pain uh, uh, and pain, people in chronic pain? Yeah, and that's the real key. The, the patients we see at our center, um, which is part of a large hospital organization in uh, San Diego, Scripps Clinic, uh, the typical patient has seen multiple uh, providers from primary care to neurology, sometimes anesthesiology, rheumatology, to typically get a diagnosis, typically get some medication management. Uh, what we try to provide is when that doesn't quite meet their expectations or the clinician's um, expectations for relief, what has not been tried and what more importantly is the driver for this pain. So, you know, I often get asked, what's, what's effective for back pain? And I say, it depends on, you know, what's underneath that. Is it an architectural issue um, that are we dealing with joint um, uh, degradation? Are we dealing with more uh, myofascial muscle tension and that patient has a s significant amount of stress mm -hmm. or inactivity, deconditioning, and we need to get mind-body therapies? Um, or is this a, an issue that may be an inflammatory condition where diet, supplements, again, exercise could be incorporated? So it really depends on digging a little bit deeper. Uh, they might have fibromyalgia or low back pain, but really what's still the driver that hasn't been addressed? And we try to come up with a small menu of options initially that are synergistic. And so as an example, if somebody comes in with neuropathic pain and they've been on it's nerve pain, nerve example, pain, yes. um, mm -hmm. that they've been on, you know, m maybe uh, narcotic medication or anticonvulsants, seizure medications, which are now FDA approved for, for nerve pain, like your Lyricas and such, still not getting there. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that if you add uh, some dietary approaches, uh, omega-3s being optimized fish oils, um, what many of us know, know that as, um, antioxidants like alpha-lipoic acid on top of their regimen, it can actually have a synergistic benefit, re sometimes reduce the amount of medicines they need and uh, provide a better quality of life. So it's not about this or that. Interesting. So the example you just gave actually has a nutritional 
approach right, right. Uh, for reducing inflammation or enhancing function in those areas. Right. Um, can you give me a, a, another example? This sure. is very, very interesting because I think uh, I, I see patients down at Fort Belvoir. Yes, There's yes. a chronic pain clinic down there that I practice in. And uh, I find that we're often struggling to, to come up with a, a systematic approach, especially for something like back pain. Mm -hmm. Back pain, very, very prominent. A lot of people have it. Back and leg pain, perhaps mm -hmm. sciatica that yes. goes down the leg or chronic back pain. And uh, it is a huge problem in the U.S., not just in, in the military. Um, and, but what you're saying is that simply treating that pain itself is insufficient. Right, right. That you need to step back and look at other factors, uh, perhaps not immediately obviously related to the pain, right. that you would look at. Uh, so if you had a back pain patient, uh, um, what are some of the more common types of things that you found to be uh, useful uh, for, for those, those Definitely. types of patients? Um, so I'll give you an example of, of um, you know, someone I saw last week or two. She had rheumatoid arthritis, but her main manifestation of pain was not in a typical scenario of you know hands and uh, you know on the periphery, but she had low back pain. So uh, what we found is that she was having insufficient response to uh, kind of the evidence-based disease-modifying agents that her rheumatologist had given her. When we talked to her, one of her main issues was that uh, you know she was very stressed out and, and had a very poor diet uh, as part of that. And we talked to her about you know taking some nutrition, uh, seeing our nutritionist, going to our cooking classes. And what I told her is, you know, there's good evidence. There's actually a great trial out of England that puts people on a Mediterranean diet who have rheumatoid arthritis with some manifestation of pain, had significant reduction in pain, but also improved quality of life, increased improvement in mood. You could say that's because the pain's better or because the omega-3s and the other uh, good fats are helping. But kind of the, the, to seal the deal, um, as part of her, uh, you know, social history and, and background was she had a significant family history of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, the good news is, uh, you know, recent evidence shows that, uh, you know, if you go on this Mediterranean diet, which to her at that point sounded foreign, uh, with you know, omega-3s and, and uh, olive oil, you have a 68% chance of reducing your chance of going on breast cancer. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a win-win. It's not about here's a drug that's going to help X, but here's an approach, starting with diet, and then adding other things like stress management that are kind of a win-win-win. Um, and I think that's what is different about integrative medicine. It's about looking at not just this patient has condition X, but how does condition X um, you know, fit the entire picture and how can you then approach this complex picture in, in a way that's patient centered. Yeah. I find it fascinating. This seems to me as a family physician who tries to take care of the whole patient almost a no-brainer. I spent right. a, lo a lot of my time in practice trying to manage the side effects of some of the treatments that I provide, the medications. Right. But what you're saying is that if you get at the underlying health enhancing components mm -hmm. of a patient, the side effects generally are positive. Yes. In other words, lots of things begin to be, get better. It's a, and, and is this the difference between a healing modality and sort of a conventional treatment modality? It, definitely. I think you said it uh, perfectly. Uh, and in medicine, we're often looking at, okay, what is your pain today? It was an eight, then is a six, five we've accomplished our goal. But in, in a healing scenario, what else is happening could be, you know, disability, quality of life issues, sleep issues. So the pain can be reduced, but the overall quality of life may be no, no better or worse if there's adverse effects from the medication. So some of these healing uh, um, modalities, and, and this was elaborated by uh, Dr. Shurkin and some other researchers, that when people do these healing modalities, your acupuncture, manipulation, massage, tai chi, yoga, what they're getting is not just pain relief, they're getting hope, uh, they're getting empowerment, uh, they're getting an improvement in their quality of life that sometimes gets lost in the visual analog scale for pain of what's your pain number today. Uh, and I think if we look deeper, we're, we're gonna get, we, we appreciate the, the overall benefit of these modalities that sometimes gets lost in our quick judgment of is it, is it reducing the pain. Yeah, sometimes I ask patients if they say, what's your pain on a 1 to 10 scale? And if they say 5 or something, I'll say, that's good. How come it's not a 7? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right exactly. And then a lot of times they'll say, well, because I do this and this and right, this. I right, say, good. Right. Those are good. the ones we're going to work on, right? <laughs> right. You, you, uh, <laughs> you Flip you it around the, yes. instead of trying to f 
figure out ways to reduce it, figure out what they're already doing that Absolutely. you can build on to enhance the healing component. This distinction between healing and curing, it seems so simple when we mm -hmm. talk about it, and yet it is fundamental, it's profound. Right. Uh, a, a system that is looking at trying to cure, and the cure comes from the outside, the, the right. system very different than something that's trying to enhance your own inherent healing capacity, uh, isn't uh, it? Definitely, and I think what one thing that's helped um, clinicians who are conventionally trained to better understand what's happening is some very innovative research into what's happening when these approaches are being uh, I employed. So, for example, uh, mind-body therapies, mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, yoga, there are fascinating functional MRI studies that show areas of the brain that control pain, like the limbic system, that, that's our fear center, uh, and pain memory centers, like hippocampus of the brain actually get altered, modulated in a way that allows that patient to deal better with the events of the day. Because pain changes the brain, and the big question is, how can healing modalities come in and uh, change things which for many decades were thought to be locked in? Right. And that's the really uh, innovative part, that research is really vetting these as not just you know, alternative therapies that are, have a placebo effect, but actual mechanistic uh, uh, ways of altering how patients experience pain. So they have biological and functional physiological effects just like other medications and treatments exactly. that have been looked at. And now the evidence is beginning to document this. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And uh, the National uh, Center for Complementary Integrative Health had some great um, you know, evidence-based summaries and, and booklets for, for both clinicians and, and patients to, to learn more about which treatment is right and when to use it, when to avoid it. So um, my mother uh, broke her hip mm. last year. She lives in San Diego yes. near okay. your clinic. She mm -hmm. actually went into the Green Hospital okay. where, you, where you practice. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, and she had it taken care of beautifully, mm -hmm. okay. The surgeons came in, they assessed it, et cetera. Right. She had it repaired and replaced the next day. Wonderful. Uh, and then it was a matter of recovery yes. and pain management. Mm -hmm. uh, she was having a you know, fair amount of pain, as you would imagine, from, from that. And she you know, was an older woman in her, in her mid to late 80s and uh, began to have some disorientation and hallucinations mm. from the medications right. afterwards. And that went on for several days. So she was uh, not knowing where she was. She was getting up. She had a vertigo where she thought she was standing when she wasn't standing, things like this. Um, and, uh, and I thought, aren't there some other ways that are available? I found out later after, she, she got better by the way, when uh, we brought in and did some healing touch on Great. her. I found out later actually it was available in the Absolutely. hospital. Absolutely, definitely. That the hospital had it available, mm -hmm. there were nurses that did it, they had acupuncture that yes. was available, but the system itself hadn't yet incorporated it in a sort of a routine way so mm -hmm. that patients actually got it. Right. And so this is sort of the, the, the next challenge. The right. evidence isn't sufficient, is it? I mean, you can have great evidence. You can even have the desire and the will right. to get it in. But there are some, some, some problems in our system to get it in. How, I, how do you get it in definitely. to a larger system so that you don't just sure. have to go to the integrative clinic to find it? Uh, well, you said it uh, perfectly with, with the statement, the evidence is not sufficient. And for many years, that was used as uh, sort of the tagline of there really isn't enough evidence-based literature. But now I think we have enough evidence-based literature like the Healing Touch study uh, in, in the military setting that uh, Dr. Granary right. and, and mm -hmm. folks at Scripps did. Um, and that's one of the reasons we've, we, for many years, have had Healing Touch started by Rowney King. And I probably know the folks who did it at the hospital. Right. The next challenge, like you said, is if the evidence is there, what's not sufficient is everyone knows about it or is comfortable with it, meaning they could have a, uh, a discussion of, okay, Healing Touch is available on the floor. Great, but when do I use it? When do I not use it? Um, who's available? So all, the things that are simplest to use and order are the things that are gonna be used most often. And that's in a busy, chaotic environment at the hospital, that's what's gonna happen. So you could, depending on the nurse you get mm -hmm. and, this, and the setting, and their comfort level, that's, that's what's going to uh, decide if, if your mother or the next patient gets that. And if, unfortunately, uh, there's not enough toolkits um, you know, on every floor of every hospital in the United States that allows the nurses and the staff to be knowledgeable and comfortable with this. So I think we need to not only put out guidelines that say we need to transform care and in involve more tools, 
but really deployed. And I think that's part of the national pain strategy. Uh, but really it takes sort of uh, on the ground efforts in your local hospital to say, is acupuncture available? Is healing touch available? And if not, um, how can you push uh, that the administrators and the hospital system to appreciate it, like places like Penny George uh, Institute and others have seen the benefit, patient care benefit, satisfaction scores, and pain reduction scores and cost benefit to then make the changes consistent across the board. So it's not it's not fragmented, it's available. And, and sorry to hear that, ha that you had to <laughs> advocate, but I often feel like pain patients and their families are often kind of fixing the bike that's broken while they're riding it. Right. So that's a scenario where you shouldn't have to do both things. I mean, it's enough to deal with the pain. You shouldn't have to, uh, you know, yeah. find so, the tools. So you said it, getting it into the system, getting mm -hmm. the system changes necessary to make it available is something that the Institute's been very interested in. Yes, and the has, Pain Collaborative. Uh, recently launched a, uh, a Pain Collaborative, which is uh, specifically geared towards helping healthcare systems, hospitals, and clinics change the system so these things do become regularly available in those areas. And I think we'll be doing another one of those in 2016, maybe more, and inviting healthcare systems to come and participate in that uh, to put these evidence-based practices into, into it. Because as you said, it's on the ground. It's in the local yep. uh, systems and hospitals that it has to have. You can definitely. Uh, you can have the, all the policy changes you want and the declarations from uh, right. the uh, Institute of Medicine and this type of thing, but in, unless you go through the hard work of getting it into the system and doing the quality improvement component, isn't it going to happen? Isn't exactly. So, so tell me, uh, I mean, you're leading this organization now, and this is these are uh, many of the practitioners that are that are doing uh, much of this work that now I think is going to become more and more prominent mm -hmm. for our healthcare system. Uh, what's next? What uh, what would you like to see? What do sure. you anticipate seeing? What do you hope see to see in this area? Absolutely. So I, I think it's um, you know my my tenure as president um, transitions as of this meeting. So, uh, but some of the things we put in place uh, over the last three years, where I've been very fortunate to lead this organization, is um, you know putting in language and putting in a training that's a little bit different than you get at other uh, meetings. So we have a wellness initiative so that pain providers who studies show are some of the most burnt out clinicians mm. do something for self-care so they're doing uh, we did a study with Cleveland Clinic uh, that showed a significant reduction in, in burnout scores um, in those clinicians so I think step one is the the folks who are taking care of pain patients need to take care of themselves and I think we are one of the we're in the front lines of, of doing that and I think more uh, pain organizations need to hopefully incorporate that. Yeah, so you're telling me that in order to take care of your pain patients most effectively, yeah. you have to take care of your own oh, pain? Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> News flash. Okay. And interestingly, the evidence actually bears it out that if you do take better care, you have uh, higher empathy scores and higher patient satisfaction scores and lower pain scores in those patients. Really? Uh, so so it's it's a win-win. It's not about you know selfishly taking care of yourself and ignoring the patient. It's a complete win-win. Um, the other things that we're really uh, looking at is uh, starting interest groups. This, this, this year we have interest groups on nutrition in medicine, in, in pain management. Um, and we have uh, ones on interprofessional care. How does a team look and work together who's, who may not just be a physician, but a physician, physical therapist, chiropractor, et, et cetera, to work in a team environment. Um, we have one on uh, the, uh, integrative pain management in the military. Uh, and so what I'm hoping for is to get groups of clinicians who are beginning to feel like they're not the only ones interested in, let's say, nutrition or, you know, uh, mind-body therapies for pain to work with other clinicians around the country to feel like there's a force here. And if I can get some done in my clinic or hospital, I can help another clinician do the same in their environment. And I think that's the future. And also just getting the literature out. I know um, Sam Welly did a great job getting the literature out on self-care doing a number of papers and getting more papers out in good journals so that clinicians know that the evidence is sufficient and that we need to sufficiently uh, incorporate the evidence in our care. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for all your years of work in this area and moving it forward. And uh, even though I know you're stepping down from the presidency of AAPM, a a uh, that you're going to be a leader in this area clearly for a long time. And I think the time has come oh. actually <laughs> for what you've been working on for so long to actually uh, see the light of day in all of medicine and be available for everyone. So well, well, thank you, Wayne. I just want to say that um, you know many of the folks who are doing what we're doing now, uh, are the basis of our knowledge comes from a lot of the work you 
have done with some of your great writings, uh, even before the Sam Welly Center, and then just what you've accomplished with the Institute and your colleagues is, is truly amazing and, and helps us, you know, the on-the-ground clinicians um, and organizations do much better work. So thank you. Great. Our next episode on human flourishing features Dr. Jeffrey Ling. Dr. Ling is the founding director of the Biology Technology Office at DARPA. Dr. Ling will join us for a discussion on recent advances in the human technology biology interface, such as using prosthetic limbs to connect brain activity to movement. We now recognize that, oh my goodness gracious, if we can read some of the signals of the brain that say, oh, move your arm, move your leg, wiggle your ears, can we use that in a beneficent way? And the answer is absolutely. And the most obvious place, and the one we started at, was someone who's lost their arm. Losing your arm is, is a very um, a debilitating condition because you lost your hand, and your hand is really how you interact with your environment. To lose that whole limb is, is really very debilitating. And in fact, the, the only thing that doctors can give now is a hook, but, and, and that's the best that you can get. So if we could really decode these messages, could we get someone to actually really run a robot arm with a robot hand. And you say, well, there's, uh, robot hands don't exist right now. They don't because what use are they? But if you put the two together, now you've got something. That episode will air on Monday, October 26th. Please join us.